So the first lesson um, that I want to pull from that story has to do with effort. Um, I got interested in Fleetwood Mac because I, was, I have a friend who works for um, Warner Records, which was their record label for many years. And we were t- talking about them, Fleetwood Mac once, and he said to me, um, what's the best Fleetwood Mac album? And I said, well, it's Rumors. He said, yes, absolutely. Right? That is the classic album. And then he said, okay, what's, what number uh, record do you think Rumors is in the discography of Fleetwood Mac, right? And I said, I don't know. I'm not a huge fan of the band. So I said, I thought, well, I, I know they did the self-titled album, Fleetwood Mac, and I assume they must have done one or two in England before they came over to America. Let's say it's album number three. He said, wrong. It was album number 16, right? 16. Um, now, remember that history that I gave you, that little potted history I started with? It was actually highly misleading because I left a lot out. I gave you the sense that the band's history was this little constrained start here, boom, and then they have rumors. In fact, the band's history is more like this. They start with Peter Green in 1967 and start playing around in the clubs of London. And in the original lineup of the band are a whole series of people who have been lost to history. Bob Bunning, Jeremy Spencer, right? These are the original guitarists in the band. And it's only after they get rid of one of those people, bring in a guy named Danny Kerwin, whoever knew what happened to Danny Kerwin, John McVie, Kerwin, I think, quits, and they bring in John McVie's girlfriend, who's a woman named Christy Perfect, who later becomes his wife, Christy McVie. But that's well down the road. And then at a certain point in the band's history, Peter Green quits because he, gets, he takes a lot of LSD and he joins a German cult. I, think, you know, I don't know whether those two things are connected, but I assume they are. And the band at that point decamps for Hampshire and buys a giant, decrepit house called, a, a manor house called Benefolds, and they... They do enormous amounts of hashish, and their kids run around naked, and they raise goats, and they have, you know, all of them have like E-type Jaguars parked in the driveway. And they play all kinds of, of strange music for on and on and on. And then at one point they come back, and they continue to keep bringing in new people. They bring in a guy named Dave Walker, who they then turn around and fire almost immediately because I think he's having an affair with one of Mick Fleetwood's girlfriends, although that itself is kind of odd because Mick Fleetwood's always having an affair with pe- pe- people's girlfriends, and... They bring, in, um, they bring in a guy named Dave Walker. They bring in a guy named um, uh, uh, Bob Weston, and they fire them almost right away, and they run into a guy in a, in a railway station called Bob Welch, an American guy who they really like, and they hire him. So the band is going through all of these constant mutations, and as they do, they keep turning out records, right? Not one, not two, but a dozen records and more as they, as they progress um, through, the 70s, through the 60s and early 70s. It's only when they get to L.A. in the early 70s and when Bob Welch finally leaves the band that they hire Lindsey Buckingham and Stevie Nicks and become the Fleetwood Mac that we know as Fleetwood Mac. Now, that process took 10 years, 10 years and 16 albums. They're not some kind of overnight sensation. They are a band that was a decade in the making. Now, that's a really critical fact because (coughs) so often when we look at great and extraordinary successes, we have some kind of sense that they came from, they came fully flowered. They arrived on the scene and their greatness was already apparent, right? And all we had to do was to find some forum for that greatness to be expressed. We have a notion that so much of what makes someone good is something natural, something inherent in that person or that organization. But when you look at Fleetwood Mac, you realize that that was the furthest thing from the case. This was a band that was anything but good for the longest time. That took 10 years to kind of find that particular sound that set them apart from everybody else. This is something actually I spent a lot of time on in in Outliers, um, this notion of how long it takes to be good. Because a lot of psychologists have actually attacked this question and have discovered something they call the 10,000 hours rule, which says that when we look at a wide variety of cognitively complex activities, we find a, 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 a very consistent pattern and that is it seems to be impossible to achieve any kind of true expertise unless you have practiced for 10,000 hours. And 10,000 hours, if you think about it, think of that as four hours a day, is 10 years. The 10-year rule shows up in almost everything. We look at, for example, um, chess grandmasters. There's only ever been one chess grandmaster in history who has achieved that level without having played chess for 10 years, and that was Bobby Fischer, who became a grandmaster after nine years. 
You can take um, lovely studies of classical music composers. Uh, you take the whole, and you, you see what is the first piece of music they wrote that was truly great. That was one of their kind of signature pieces. And it has never been the case that a truly world-class piece, piece of classical music has been composed before the composer was composing for 10 years. Now, people always say, well, what about Mozart? Well, was Mozart composing in his at 10 and 11 years old? Absolutely. Have you ever listened to the things he was, he was composing at 10 and 11? They're terrible. He wasn't any good until he was 23 and writes Concerto Number no. 9271.